and welcome to our series targeting maths teachers in the FET phase and of course everyone else who's interested in education in the country. First up, let's take a look at our video. This is the uh, echo sounder that gives us the depth from the ship and we use this for profiling the seabed and once you've profiled it, you can actually map and turn it into a similar map that you use on land. Trigonometry is used extensively in real-world situations like navigation, surveying and engineering to find distances and angles. The challenge often arising for learners lies in being able to interpret the drawings that we use in the text to represent the real world. Three-dimensional real situations which exist in real space are limited to being represented in the single plane of the page and learners are not always able to read diagrams. I think that there's been more of a focus on numerical thinking than on spatial thinking. They might get through with all the numerical competence and it's when they have to, they're put in a situation where their spatial sense is being assessed. That is where they fall flat completely and a lot of the high school work the, the, the solving of the geometry riders, the, the calculus and um, the solving of using calculus to solve those problems involving volume and all of this presuppose an understanding of three-dimensional shapes. At Hillview Senior, the teacher Ms. Frankson is introducing her learners to some of the conventions and language associated with three-dimensional drawings. The outcomes for the learners are to gain experience with moving between single-plane geometric figures and multi-plane 3D models, to take the opportunity to interact and see the right angles and triangles represented in the drawings and to gain understanding of some of the conventions and language associated with 3D drawings. To me the most important outcome was letting the kids see the difference how we represent 3D. It's, it's, it's normally done in isolation and, and they can't grasp whether it's 3D and in a single plane. That's the difficulty that they have. The teacher begins the lesson with a diagnostic. She gets learners to complete a worksheet containing various two-dimensional and three-dimensional shapes. In the first column, you're going to guess where's the center of those shapes. In the second one, you're finding it using a ruler and a pencil, the exact center, okay? Learners were comfortable working with the two dimensions or a single plane. But when they had to try to locate the center of three-dimensional shapes represented on paper, they struggled. They don't conceptualize. They can't see the object unless it's physically brought into the classroom. Many teachers avoid taking learners through the process of understanding the three-dimensional shapes, blaming it on a lack of available time. It becomes neglected because, well, maybe teachers themselves don't actually understand what the value of it is because maybe they themselves were assessed more for their numerical thinking than for their spatial thinking. An understanding of the properties of the geometric shapes is key to solving the 3D problems. And given that the learners had very little experience working with representing 3D shapes, Ms. Frankson decided to start with a rectangular prism or box. What do you notice about the surfaces of your box? The uh, two opposite sides are equal. The teacher begins by discussing the properties of the box. What shape is that? Rectangle. How do you know it's a rectangle? Because two opposite sides. The opposite sides are equal. The opposite sides are equal. Okay. How many surfaces in that particular shape that you have there? Count yours, let's see. Six. Six. It has six surfaces. How many edges on the box? Now, where would the edge be? On the corner where the two surfaces meet. That's one plane. That's the second plane. Where they meet, that's the edge. Okay, yes. And that, yes, Justine, that's also an edge. So where's another edge? That one as well. That one's another edge as well. So how many have we counted so far? Four. One, two, three, four. Are there only four? No. Where else are the edges? Let's turn it upside down. Five, six, seven, eight. Have we finished count the edges? No. no. And where they meet on the side? Nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Are we all happy? Yes. And how many corners are there? Eight. There are eight corners. Okay. The corners are referred to as the vertices. In the next activity, learners cut up the size of the box. In front of you are six planes. 
A plane is a, ge is a geometrical figure where a line joining any two of its points lie on completely on the surface. In other words, if I labeled one of the figures here, A, B, C, D, that would be called a plane. It's a flat surface. Okay. It's a three the teacher will now introduce the idea of the third dimension. Object. Now, how would I know it's a three-dimensional object? Because it has three dimensions. What would those dimensions be? It's got a top, a bottom, and a side. Although the learner is incorrect, the teacher acknowledges that he is on the right track and proceeds to develop the concept further. What shape is the bottom? A rectangle. And what dimensions does a rectangle have? What's that side? What is this? Length. It's the length, yes, Lauren. And what's that side? Width. The width. Okay, it's the width. As compared to the box, what does the box have that the flat rectangle doesn't have? It's got depth. We're now going to try and represent the 3D on a flat surface. She begins by cutting the box up and attaches the top plane with the bottom plane. We're going to use string for the other four planes. The new box, made up of string sides, is stuck to the board and represented on a single plane. The teacher will then discuss the representation of the properties of a 3D shape on a single plane. What do I notice about those opposite sides? They're equal and they're parallel. And they are parallel. If I have to look at this shape, what shape is that? It's a quad, it's a special type of quad. What do I know about that quad? What did we say the sides are? Parallel. They're parallel. The opposite sides of that quad are parallel. So what type of a quad does it make? Parallelogram. Excellent, it's a parallelogram. Initially we had a rectangle, and in our flat plane, the rectangle is represented by the parallelogram. And representing it as a parallelogram doesn't mean that we get rid of the properties of, of the rectangle. It's a representation. And with the representation, we maintain the properties. That Another important property is the representation of three-dimensional okay. angles on a two-dimensional surface. Where would the right angles in the diagram be? A learner draws the obvious 90-degree angles. Another learner uses a box as an aid in representing the less obvious 90 degree angles. You marked the top four, that's right. So you're marking those four, that's right. In this activity, the teacher gets learners to build the box using toothpicks and press stick. Many teachers believe that the process of building models in maths is non-beneficial and is a waste of time. I think even learners themselves would, would hanker after that type of physical experience of building models. You know, it's, it's almost like denying them something which happens in the real world. You know, you'd, mathematical modeling as, as, as a way of teaching is something which happens in, in many, many real life applications. So I think that it's, it's essential. I don't think it's a waste of time at all. I want you to insert that piece of string to represent the diagonal. The teacher reminds the learners that the diagonal of any polygon is the line segment joining a vertex with another non-adjacent vertex. Looking at the diagonal, how many right-angled triangles do I see? If your diagonal forms, you have a hypotenuse of this triangle, and this would form your first triangle. We take it for granted that the kids do recognize it, and yet they don't, because they're not, they cannot see it concretely. Until they've seen it concretely, then um, they'll be able to deal with the abstract. How many do you see, girls? Four. Count them for me, let me see. One, two, three, four. Very good. I want you to calculate the length of the diagonal. What other information do I need to tell you? Just give me the two, uh, two sides of it. So if I give you two sides, how would you find the diagonal? You square both the sides and the end. What if I didn't have a right angle triangle? How would I then find the diagonal? What do I need to give you then? Use your sine and cosine. I'd use my cosine rule or I'd use my, my sine rule.
One of the challenges that learners face is the visualization of 3D trigonometry problems in the exam paper. They have a problem in taking down this three-dimensional shape and bringing it down into two-dimensional planes. It is important to begin by reading the questions carefully. It says in the diagram alongside, P, Q and R are three points on the same horizontal plane. So that is a plane on the horizontal level. And SR is a vertical tower. So there you've got your vertical tower. In this class activity, learners are given a worksheet with a problem to solve. I want you to create the 3D out of that flat plane. You know, the ability to visualize and to see things in different orientations, to see things from different perspectives, is a very important skill. And if, if it's never developed, the, the students are clearly disadvantaged. How many triangles do you see? The teacher, together with the learners, will explore the fact that three dimensions exist in two planes and that the two planes are at right angles to each other. What's the difference between your triangles there? What's the difference? Horizontal. The one is in a horizontal plane and the one is in a vertical plane. Okay. The next step is to separate the 3D model into its individual shapes. What I want you to do now is, using your, your diagram, I want you to label the triangles in the diagram and redraw them on a single plane, labeled. For instance, P, Q, R could be drawn merely as that there, as a triangle, P, Q, R. If one looks at S, Q, R, one could sift out the triangle and draw one such S, Q, R with that 90 degrees there. So one notice, notices that this three-dimensional object now, from the diagram to the model, is being, is, we are now able to further break it down into just solving of triangles. For the first time, some learners are starting to make sense of the geometry. For me, geometry is difficult because I can't distinguish what is going on in a diagram. So if you're building it yourself, you will know that's a 90-degree angle and that's the hypotenuse and the difference. Now we've seen the video, it's time for us to welcome our guests, Tasca Matlejwane from Pafohang Secondary School in Soweto. We've got Mudia Hilekwane from the Gauteng Department of Education. Mm -hmm. And we've got Peter Middleton from Protec. Thank you very much for joining us. First question with you, Tasca. What sort of problems do learners have with activities involving three dimensions? From my experience, I realize learners have a problem when it comes to uh, more than two dimensions. Two dimensions is a natural thing that which they deal with on everyday basis. But the minute you introduce the third dimension, it becomes problematic. They cannot figure it out how it's drawn. Because in the first place, uh, the way we write or draw, we use flat surface. Mm -hmm. Yet you want to depict a three-dimensional thing. But uh, in phys physical life, in real life, things are in three dimension. Now, the, 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 the problem of seeing something on a flat surface in three-dimensional becomes a problem in terms of viewing it. Okay. I must say, we have not really been trained to think laterally, creatively. Um, in most cases, we are just given, for instance, a triangle, draw a triangle. Mm -hmm. You are not required to do it. Uh, on a three-dimensional basis, you know? And with practice, if, if you don't get enough practice to do that, then there's no way that you can, you know, polish those skills. It's very important, like, if you develop a skill on how to uh, draw that on, on a flat surface, as he has mentioned, and also, maybe if the educator has done, this was a very good lesson, I must say, as the educator has done, brought out those uh, toothpicks and whatever to put together and put a three-dimensional uh, shape together. Okay, Peter? Mm. Yeah, I, I think the, the, the problem is about representation and about how abstract something is. And for me, the challenge is to make reality come into it. You know, for example, we all know what a roof looks like. Mm -hmm. If you put a drawing of a roof down, then kids know what that is because they know what roofs are. They see them in their houses. Mm. It's very important with things that you don't know what they are. And you know, now we're talking just triangles and we've got one triangle with a, with a thing up. With, 
if, if, if it's something abstract, then you must try and represent that so that kids know what it is. It's about understanding what they're looking at. It's about representation. And for me, I think, you know, we've failed in many ways because we've over theoreticized everything. The drawings are, as you say, just triangles. A triangle is a triangle. Yeah. It's not a thing. If you draw a, a telephone post sticking up and a line going down and you say that's a telephone post and that's, a, that's the wire holding it up, then, then kids can appreciate what you're talking about. Understanding. And they know it's going up then because they know what a telephone looks like. But then how else do teachers overcome these problems? Well, yeah, that's the thing. I mean, I, I, I agree it was done very well here because you're overcoming it by making the, the 3D models. What I'm suggesting is that an underlying way of dealing with it is to make the problems real in the first place and to make the pictures look real. Not, not triangles, but telephone posts, but roofs, but things that are real, things that kids can have seen outside of the classroom. Mm. I think, as I have mentioned, with lateral thinking, uh, you know, really motivating the learners to think creatively, be innovative, innovative, you know, that will really help. Uh, we shouldn't only be motivated to think creatively in a in an art lesson, mm -hmm. you know, where you are required to draw a face of a human being mm -hmm. as we see it. You know, that is very important. So basically, with practice, with practice, it's very important. That's how educators can help learners overcome this problem. Tasca? Yeah, I quite agree with them. Uh, modeling things that which are around them is very important. Starting from the, the, the teacher's table, mm. see it practically there. Mm. And then before maybe even you go to cut out some boxes and so on. And they, 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 they relate it better to them. Now, what are the benefits of learners actually working with 3D models? The, the benefit is they are now touching real life. Mm -hmm. Because it's only with 3D model where you would say uh, the, 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 the subject matter or the theory which we do in class is directly connected to real life. Mm -hmm. Because real life is about three dimensions and nothing less than that. Although we try to learn things, putting it on two dimensions, on a flat sheet and so forth. Now, I, I think the three dimensions, that's the very first time where learners start to say, I'm really going to be an engineer, or I'm going to go into this career, I'm going to make things happen, because they touch real things. Mujie? Uh, bringing in models into your classroom takes us back to our training as educators. Visuals or teaching aids are more important than just telling learners that Okay, a trig ratio is like this, a tan is opposite over adjacent. Or as she was introducing that lesson, it's, it's very important to visualize what you are being taught. And that, that, uh, with that, it will remain in, the, in your mind. You'll remember that more. For longer. Yes. Yeah. There's also the interactiveness. Mm. Because, um, you know, it's like, like the, the computer games being interactive. A, a, a learner needs to engage. And a 3D model allows them to engage in a way that, that no drawing can. Because you, could, you put something there, you can take it away, you can measure the piece of string. You've got all sorts of ways of engaging, even measurement. You know, if, we, if we're talking about um, how we measure things, if we're measuring something real, then we might not use any instrument. We just might see, oh, I need it to be this long. You have your intuitive measurement because you've got something there to measure it against. Something real. It becomes much more interactive, much more meaningful. Now, Mujie, how do you feel about the way the teacher managed the class? Um, I think the teacher managed the class well, other than on the arrangement of learners within the class. I saw there were many empty desks here and there, and you know the, the arrangement, the learners were not properly arranged in groups you know, so they can uh, learn from each other's experiences as they discover the three-dimensional uh, three shape that they were being taught. Mm. Tasca? That was a well-presented lesson, I must say. I personally enjoyed it. But like, uh, as Mudiere said, uh, the minimal interaction with learners uh, also leaves some question marks. To say, uh, have learners equally enjoyed it as we did? I, 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 that's the question that which I have. and. Uh, further than that, uh, I think that the model, the way she modeled out her teaching aids, 
it was fantastic. Okay, Peter? Mm. No, I agree. You know, whenever you've got 3D modeling, um, then you've got resources. And the management, I thought she did very well in terms of resourcing. It was simple, toothpicks are available, press stickers available, mm -hmm. strings available. Those, those kind of decisions were well made and, and they're underrated. Those, those are important decisions for a teacher to have to make. What to use, how easily I can do it. And, and she did some very clever stuff. Okay. So I was impressed actually. Mm -hmm. Any other issues you'd like to raise? Um, I... You know, it's all very well to, to use toothpicks and, and, and to make a 3D model. But at the end of the day, it's still a 3D model. Now, they've made something that's got a shape with toothpicks, but it's still a shape. Mm -hmm. I, I'd like to see more reality. Mm -hmm. I'd, li I'd like to see roof trusses. They've got lovely triangles. They have a purpose mm -hmm. in life. Mm -hmm. I'd like to see... Bring it closer to home. Much closer to home. I'd like to see them see, see them saying, okay, there is a um, basketball hoop. Make it stand up by itself. Put triangles in so that the basketball hoop stays up. Make sure that when you throw the ball in, the hoop doesn't fall on the floor. Make it strong. These things make it make and enrich what kids are doing. It enriches their enjoyment. And just because we are making models doesn't mean that we have become untheoretical. We only become less theoretical and more concrete, as she was saying in that lesson, when we are dealing with real things for a purpose. Okay, Mujahi? I should say, as I have mentioned earlier, it was a very good uh, presentation of a lesson, and maybe more examples should, be, uh, should have been brought in. Okay, Tasca? Yeah, I, I would say connecting maths to everyday life mm. is important. There, there should have been more scenarios from practical life situation, like, you know, coming up with words and then they model from those words. They read the words and then they come up with a model. But the, the fact of the matter is, if they touch real life situations, talking of a mountain, the top of the tree in the school and so forth, or even the, the, the height of a person without touching that person and so on. You, you know, it, it has lots of applications that which could be touched in this case. Okay. Yeah. And the other thing maybe, if I, I may mention, uh, it, it, it shows sometimes how mathematics can be far more perfect than the physical science part of things. Like when you have those triangles, with one unit each with the diagonal, which is the square root of two. Whereas the square root of two, you cannot easily measure it uh, on a rule and so on. But it comes out to be a particular distance because some learners tend to confuse the square root of two as if maybe it's not a number. And they should realize that it's just a number like one or two or three. Well, that's how we come to the end of this session. Thank you very much, I guess, for joining us. That's Tasca Mudiehi and Peter. Do stay tuned for Module 17 coming up soon. Mm -hmm.